Hello. Hello, 200 people I've known for 10 years. Um, wow. All right. Awesome. Um, so when Andy was first uh, organizing this conference, he asked me to uh, bring some sheen of wisdom from an oldster, because uh, there'd be so many uh, new Kickstarter kind of people here. I tried to talk, uh, talk him out of it all the way up to last week. Um, but uh, he argued someone like me that has had a long-term project probably has some insights, so that's why I'm here. So uh, most, eh, maybe half of you know what this is. Um, in 1999, I started this community web blog. Um, I went with the community model because I just didn't think I could do it myself. Um, a lot of this was, a lot of the early success of the site was just being in the right place at the right time. But you know, I also had the right tools available. I built all my own tools at the time, and I took it pretty seriously right after it launched. So it currently has about 60,000 paid members. Um, in 2003, the site grew and grew, and we eventually added a question and answer site. Um, and that just sort of took off and went crazy. And by 2005, I got to quit my day job and work on the site full time. Um, I hired my first employee right after that, uh, and now it's six people running this site. Um, so, uh, there's this long process um, where I've heard this two or three times today. I had to become like a reluctant businessman. Um, never really wanted to, didn't know what I was doing. Uh, it took a while, then I eventually had to find a lawyer and an investment guy and an accountant, and it helps to know old people that know how the business world works. Uh, so you don't have to stumble through this stuff, and uh, it's, yeah, I should write that up someday. Uh, so I learned a lot along the way, and here's some stuff I want to share. Um, my time's kind of short, so I'm just going to talk about three big lessons that I've learned from a long-term project. Uh, I hope everyone in here can get a long-term project going. Um, and uh, here we go. So the first thing is failure is the greatest teacher. Um, the word failure has a lot of negative connotations. I've always embraced it. Um, Failure is great on the most basic level uh, because at least it tells you what doesn't work. Uh, if you think of whatever you're working on is like a giant maze, hitting a dead end isn't the end of the maze. You can just turn around, at least, well, that's one option down. I can keep going. Um, I only think of failure as a bad thing when you just uh, give up or ignore any lessons that can come out of that. Um, so if you treat it as a dead end, uh, that's the only time you've really uh, failed. Um, thankfully, we have this new awful word I hate hearing, but I like the sentiment, and uh, you hear this on business blogs. I will never say this word. I'm not even going to say it. Um, <laughs> people do this thing to their product <laughs> or project. They love to talk about doing this thing uh, in an effort to figure out what could work. Um, it's a terrible word, but it puts a nice face on failure because you basically screw up, try again, screw up, try again. Uh, and that's what this word describes. <laughs> Yay! I'll never say that word again. Um, when you start to be okay with failure, uh, I mean, this sums it up. You throw shit at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, that's what I do in day in and day out. Um, I think everyone here that doesn't work in a cubicle farm gets to do that at their job. Uh, and I think it's a great thing. Um, I think it's what creative people should do and do. Uh, and you should be doing as often as possible. Um, don't, be, don't fear failure. Try new things. Also, create an environment for yourself where this is possible. Um, you know, maybe that's like setting aside the time. That's like one of the awesome things I think Google does, the 20% time. One day a week, you can screw around and make a project, anything you want. They've had so much commercial success with that. They keep allowing people to, to do that. Um, if you're a coder, you know, set up a staging server where you can just goof off every day a little bit on some personal project. You never know what's going to happen. So, like, give yourself the conditions to make that work. Um, and then you might be surprised what, what you come up with. Um, as I've been saying, it is important not to be afraid of failure. Um, whenever I fail spectacularly or minorly, I take notes. Um, I've got like a whole bunch of old text files and a lot of unpublished blog posts. That's where they seem to stick around, um, saying what went wrong. I try to write stuff down, what's still fresh in my mind, what worked, what didn't work. Um, 
I've got two projects that are working out pretty well, but I've got like a dozen bodies in my wake that didn't work out so well. Um, here's a few that just didn't work out that well. Um, so here's one, ticket stubs. Um, I was moving from an apartment to a house and I noticed um, cleaning out some drawers. I had about 10 ticket stubs that I saved for about 10 years. And each one had like some special story. Here's the parking lot stub from when I proposed to my wife. And here's the first concert I saw in LA or whatever. Um, and I thought, hey, these are pretty good. I, I, other people probably have these things. I should start a site. Um, so you had a, this is a 2003. You had to like scan a, a ticket stub or take a photo of it. And you had to write a story about it. But after the initial launch and about 20 people posting awesome stories and stubs, uh, it was just like Bruce Springsteen mega fans emailing me about like, why can't I upload 58 ticket stubs with every single show's review? And I was trying to say, no, it's the story, and the URL was stories about ticket stubs. Um, but I just wanted the one story about them meeting their spouse or something at a show. I did not want uh, album reviews or stuff like that. So uh, my big lesson from this, I eventually gave up because I was just like, oh, like two years of fielding these dumb emails every morning. Uh, I used to have to approve every story that went up, so there was always a backlog, and I'd, I felt really bad hurting someone's feelings, like canceling, you know, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> so uh, my big lesson from this was like, uh, simple ideas work better uh, than a complicated concept like what I had. Um, and most of the first time visitors just didn't get it. Uh, and I, I, I need to try harder like explaining it to them or I should have just simplified the idea more. So um, now I think it could probably take off. Um, so I'm thinking about coming back and there, I found there was a site called like Stub Stories or something that's basically been doing this for the last few years. Um, I had this site PVR blog and it was just this blog I started in like 2003 and it was about like TiVo tricks I'd picked up and I was reading like forums, I was setting up like a new house home theater and I was just writing all this stuff down. It was super fun, I was just spending hours of research doing this. I'd just write a little blog post each day. Um, about the time it launched, uh, Google's AdSense launched, so I uh, slapped that on there and then like the first day it made $100 which just blew, blew my mind. Um, so at its height, uh, it, well, it just got more and more lucrative. I was just writing one post a day at its height. I probably was making four or five grand a month off this one blog about this one narrow topic. Um, and it was fun. Uh, and it was making more than Metafilter and it was paying my mortgage and bills. Uh, probably helped me quit my job. It was great. And then I come from a world of academics. Like I was a grad student. I worked at UCLA as my first job. Uh, I grew up on the college internet. Um, so in the academic world, everyone shares everything they, they've learned. So I wrote a an essay going, hey, check this out. You can make money blogging. It's crazy, but it worked. Um, and Google loved it. Um, they made PBR blog like a case study on their site. And this essay I wrote just skyrocketed, uh, went out of control. Um, the downside was like within three or four months, there were seven blogs about TiVos covered in ads. One of them was from Weblogs Inc., which is like a big AOL owned thing now along with the original owner of that site threatening me with like taking it over and using the same name and because I didn't trademark it. Anyways, long story short, <laughs> uh, this, this project kind of faded out. Uh, I got tired of like, it started to be a chore to like look up news about the stuff. I just wasn't interested in it forever. And it sort of died a long, slow death. Um, this is like, I'm conflicted about this lesson, but if I would have shut the hell up and not told anyone anything, I probably would have had this like, you know, secret money machine going on and on forever. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I think, you know, improve the world by spreading some knowledge. I, uh, so I'm okay with it, but that one's a little weird. Um, we built this whole section of Metafilter just based on travel, uh, called Travel Filter. We never launched it, but we built it. It was running, it was working. Um, it was gonna be, com it, wasn't, it was gonna be kind of separate from Metafilter. We learned our lesson from this was like a couple lessons. One was uh, don't cannibalize from your own success. Like we were just gonna chop out all the travel parts of a question and answer site and just make a travel question and answer site. But that was like everyone's favorite part of the original. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe we'll launch like a whole new travel site that's not even at a Metafilter URL, but then it doesn't have the huge community of nice people. 
and we don't we can't manage a whole bunch of strangers on a new community where everyone's gonna be spamming about their hotel and stuff like that. Uh, in the end, we sort of had it running on the side for about six months and then shuttered it and put it back the way it was. But really, we learned like we didn't commit. Um, you might have heard this phrase like burn the boats, if you ever heard that, um, about Cortez invading Aztecs, Incas. Um, to prevent a mutiny, you know, you come from Spain, you go to Mexico, you're going to steal their gold. Uh, you don't want your crew to just think, we're just here to steal the gold and fail. You burn the boats when they arrive, so they really commit to the, uh, to the venture. So we didn't burn the boats here. We should have. We've done this with other parts of the site where we just we made a meetup specific part of the site, and that was a big part of some other part of the site, and we just cut it off. Like, no more meetup talk. It's all going on the new site, and it actually got better. So we should have really committed to that. Uh, a half-assed solution will never work. I guess that's my bottom line on that. I also worked on employee, as an employee on several dot-coms that didn't do so hot. Um, Blogger comes to mind, uh, launched a couple of months after Metafilter, and I joined it about a year into its existence for a little while. Uh, this was right in the middle of the dot-com bust, um, and it sort of didn't have any revenue, didn't have any funding, and everyone sort of had to fail. And uh, the, one of the co-founders just sort of ran it on fumes and credit cards for a few years. I mean, it's not a complete failure, like Google bought it. So <laughs> things went well later. Um, it eventually was starting to get a little bit of revenue right before that happened. Um, I think our takeaway on this one was, uh, you know, wrong place, wrong time, but also we didn't start taking money from these customers. Uh, and we weren't treating everyone as a customer, all these users, but like we were supporting them and giving them a tool and like we could have easily asked for a dollar or two. Um, and the co-founder that kept that going is Evan Williams, and I think he embodies a lot of this uh, this isn't like a dig against him, but he failed several companies in Nebraska. He comes to California with no money, starts a company with Pyra and then Blogger, and that's not going so hot. And then Google picks it up. He leaves Google as soon as he can. He starts Odeo, which was going to be awesome, and then iTunes crushes it like a few days later, and like uh, eventually spins off Twitter from Odeo. So I mean, Ev is a guy who's been pushed down over and over and over again, uh, met with tons of failure, but he always gets up. Uh, now he's doing Obvious Labs, which is kind of a company that throws shit at the wall to see what sticks. I don't know if any of his new ventures are going to work out, but they're all crazy and it's cool. Uh, and I'm like impressed that you know he sort of embraces uh, failure. Boom, boom, gets up eventually. Um, here's a second big lesson. Uh, Money is the least interesting problem, the least interesting thing to optimize for. Um, it's a necessary evil, uh, and that's kind of how I've always viewed it. Um, so in the last 13 years, uh, money's like just a low-level nagging issue all the time for me. Um, it's cool that it pays for healthcare and employees and my mortgage, but like it's mostly a distraction. Um, at first, the site was just like a side project, and it was years before money came in. And at first, we just paid for better servers. Eventually, we were paying for employees. Uh, I tried not to let it dominate my thinking. Um, the times I focused solely on money are like some of my worst memories ever of the site. I made the worst decisions. Uh, whenever I've like convinced my ad reps at Google, they fly me down and we talk, and I go, OK, I'll give in. Like, I've just made the worst decisions possible uh, whenever you're aiming for money first. Um, Jeff Bezos last week called this the Amazon Doctrine at the Kindle launch. He said he uh, always aligns the company's interests with his customers, so he's never at odds with them. He's never aligned with the advertisers or content providers. I think it's awesome. So like whenever the customers win, Amazon wins. Uh, it's not easy. It's super hard to think. There's like half of the things that Metafilter does are kind of aligned with the users, and I think, unfortunately, there's some advertising that's not always awesome uh, that I have to contend with. So this is really hard to do, but I think it's like an awesome mantra for them. And completely different from Apple, I think. Um, so while I'm mentioning smart, famous people, I'm going to mention Tim O'Reilly, who's here somewhere. Um, he wrote this amazing essay in 2009 about working on stuff that matters. And I'm paraphrasing, but when he said, when he discussed money, he said, like, uh, like a startup or a company is kind of like taking a cross-country trip, and uh, money is just sort of the gas in the tank. Uh, and when you take a 
cross-country road trip, you're not going on a tour of gas stations. Like, we're not, it's not about the gas. Um, even though that's all anyone wants to talk about, that's all business magazines want to obsess about. It's about the journey, and the gas is the thing you need to do, but leave it at that. Ah, so, yeah, the times I've tweaked and monitored every dollar coming in, the times I lost sleep, uh, I was constantly stressed out. Uh, I was ready to throw in the towel several times uh, whenever I freaked out about money. So don't do that. Uh, the best days I've ever had working on my projects was when I made like a coding breakthrough, I thought of a new feature and implemented it. Uh, these are the things that just made the projects better uh, when they did new things. Uh, none of the best days I can remember had anything to do with money. Here's the uh, third unfortunate lesson. Uh, success is fleeting. Uh, stay on your toes. Um, <clears throat> So I've had several of my projects get popular for a short time and go away. Um, I've always sort of understood that success is fleeting, and now I'm just sort of seeing it, watching the industry, that it's unbelievable how quickly new stuff is replacing old stuff. Uh, I mean, we're all here because we're part of that. Um, if I had to plot a graph of the typical project success, it probably looks like Mount Fuji, you know, pretty quick up, pretty quick down. Um, Maybe a long approach, but you know, things are gonna go down. Something like this, you know, success over time. Uh, most of my projects have followed this path. Um, Metafilter's sort of like a long mound. Um, uh, and that's, those are hard to set up, because I'm used to seeing this everywhere else and on most of my projects. <clears throat> I kind of feel like Metafilter's maybe on the down part of that mound too, so. Uh, this is just sort of a story of growth and decay. Uh, I've seen it a zillion times. If you look at web publishing, you know, we started with pages and our own servers and then free servers and then we went to, you know, let's have a blog and let's just cut it down to paragraphs and then we sort of went to status updates. Uh, and, you know, now it's like, I don't know what likes and pins are except, you know, your intent or something in a single click. But, you know, there's sort of like a trail of bodies from this. Uh, you know, MySpace is sort of a punchline at this point. Um, but this is what's happening. These things are king for a while, and then they're gone. Then the next thing replaces it. The next thing comes around. Uh, I see this in every other industry, and it's happening like crazy right now. Uh, you know, Hertz, Hertz rents cars for a day, and did that for decades, and it was fine. And then Zipcar comes along and says, hey, you can have a car for a few hours, uh, and freaks Hertz out. I get emails from Hertz saying you can rent a car for a few hours now. Uh, <laughs> And anyone in Portland knows there's this new thing called Car to Go, which says you can rent a car for minutes. Like in Zipcar is freaking out. Like I get crazy emails from Zipcar going, we still exist. Um, oh, and Car, Car to Go does the free parking, which is another hassle in Portland uh, that you pay for parking. And it's free with those cars. And there's this other weird P2P kind of stuff happening. Um, one of them is called Relay Rides, where anyone can rent any car to anyone else for any so sort of time. And it's like, what? Like, <laughs> um, and I know when uh, someone was telling me in San Francisco, you know, Uber's replacing cabs, and there's two services replacing Uber by doing like person-to-person -person Uber, where you can just drive people around when you feel like it and get paid. <laughs> like, it's, like, wasn't Uber awesome two months ago? <laughs> So this pattern of something getting big and fading away and getting replaced seems to be going quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, and I think there's just a lot more tools available. There's like pattern libraries and programming languages and there's like scripting frameworks for, at least for web projects, you can go from like idea to a alpha in like a day. And it, you know, it's all centered around like open knowledge and we're all building on each other's work. Uh, but it just makes the competition way more fierce. So the real, a real problem, I'm, facing today is relevance. Um, like Metafilter is going to be 14 years old soon and uh, like does it make any sense today? Um, like was it going to be in the year 2020? Is it going to exist in the year 2020? I mean I've already gone over a decade with this project so you know I've got to keep my long-term thinking cap on at all times. But I would say it never hurts to ask yourself where is your project going to be in 2020? Whether that's whatever you're working on now. Um, in the short term, I've sort of got this immediate threat, but it's not like Quora and Yahoo Answers, these things that are also Q&A sites. There's a zillion Q&A sites now. Um, I don't think Q&A is a zero-sum game. If someone asks a question in one place, that doesn't mean I get one less question on Ask Metafilter. 
Um, I'm actually kind of afraid of hardware at this point. Um, and here's the story behind that. Um, so like iPhone is five years old now, but sometime in 2009, it sort of starts showing up on our server logs as a thing. Oh, hey, a couple percent. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, 2010, oh, 12%, that's a little high. <laughs> and then last year, it's 20, over 20% 20 of all access iPhone, okay. And then look a few months ago, and it's 30% and climbing. And I think it's at 32, 33% now. All accesses to the site are on a mobile device. Like, that's crazy. Um, so there's a couple ads on the site. Uh, and we're sort of seeing this, like, and I know I said not to worry about money, but you could see, like, a, a pretty a nice downward trend on the uh, money, even though the traffic is pretty solid and going up a little bit. You know, and I'm not a guy who hates advertising. Like, I click on ads all the time on my desktop. Uh, I rarely ever click on them on a phone. Um, you know, this is what the New York Times looks like, but this is how I read the New York Times. I just double tap, and there's no ads. And if I'm in the middle of the article, even if there's a great ad, I'm not going to stop reading an article. So, I mean, mobile clicks are ridiculous. Like, they don't work. It doesn't happen. Uh, it's like, t uh, desktop's easy to manage 20 tabs. It's a pain in the butt on a phone. You can't see much on a phone. Um, a few months ago, I was in New York, uh, visited some friends at all these companies, and everyone was kind of like, yeah, we're 25% mobile, we're at 30% mobile. Half of them were like, I don't know what that means, and the other half were like, eh, it kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> the ones that are in the business of like selling display ads. So I don't know if the future of the web or uh, web sort of companies to release a mobile app for everything, but like when a third of your audience is using a single device, maybe you should think about it, especially if you can do something that's better than the actual site. Um, I also think it's a huge opportunity for someone to just outdo Google. Uh, Google's always, Google is basically an ad company that like makes some maps on the side and does a little bit of email. They don't want people to know this, but they are a multi-billion dollar ad company, but they don't really have an answer for like mobile ads. And I think there's a huge opportunity for someone to come up with something. <clears throat> I know there's like two owners of ad networks in this room that have sent me checks before and I feel bad. But you guys could, you guys could eat Google's lunch if you can figure this out. Um, mobile's a huge revolution. This is the official Olympics website reporting 60% use by mobile. So that's people on the ground looking up schedules and looking up venue locations and probably people on the couch like me looking at an iPad while I was watching it. But that's like tremendous 60% use. Um, analysts say like we were going to hit 50% mobile uses on every site by 2015. I actually think that's too conservative. I think we'll be there by 2014 if not next year. It's basically going up by like 2% a month on everyone's servers I've talked to. Um, so obviously the next step is like ubiquitous computing. Uh, just uh, internet connected devices everywhere, tiny as possible, uh, even beyond mobile. Um, this is sort of a bunch of Kickstarters uh, I've seen recently. I've funded some of these. These are like things that be part of our everyday lives. They're connected to the web. They're looking up information for you. They're doing one single task. Uh, I don't know what this means for content sites. Uh, you know, it's, this is the, the great unknown here. Um, like, I run a big content site, I have a space for people to discuss things. And some of these things like can go out and find an answer for you and make a light blink. And like it reduces everything I do to a blinking light. Um, <laughs> I love Mike Kuni Kuniovsky, but like his whole world is making blinking lights. Um, so I have no idea where Metafilter fits in the world of 2020 when this is what our next wave of computing looks like. Um, but it is exciting. It's an exciting time to be around. So I'll just sum up really quick. Leave you with this. Embrace failure. Learn from its lessons. Refactor when necessary. Incorporate all your failures as feedback. Make the best thing you can. Uh, don't waste too much time freaking out about money. Uh, there's always better ways to spend your energy, especially when you're strapped for time or expertise. And finally, the future is a crazy, uncertain place. And it's fun ramping up to the top, but beware of the descent on the other side. Stay on your toes. Always be ready to try new things. Um, the future is bright. I see it as super exciting. It's a little iffy, but it's okay. Uh, I'm glad I get to share this crazy bright future with everyone here. So uh, thanks. <laughs>